Good morning and welcome to Morning Prayer from All Saints Church, a Lutheran Episcopal community um, in Washington Courthouse, Ohio, and um, St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Hillsboro, Ohio, for um, the Lesser Feasts of James DeCoven and Jonathan Edwards. Um, James DeCoven is, is uh, honored in the Episcopal Church and uh, Jonathan Edwards in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. So James DeCoven is pre priest and teacher. He was born in Middletown, Connecticut on September 19, 1831, ordained by Bishop Kemper in 1855, and appointed professor of ecclesiastical history at Neshota House. In addition, he administered a preparatory school and assisted at the Church of St. John Chrysostom in Delafield, Wisconsin. Neshota House was associated from the time of its foundation with many of the principles of the Oxford movement, above all in its emphasis on the sacramental life of the Church and the expression of devotion to the Eucharist, including such practices as bowing to the altar at the name of Jesus and before receiving communion. In 1859, DeCoven became warden of Racine College at Racine, Wisconsin. DeCoven came to national attention at the General Convention of 1871 and 1874, when the controversy over ritualism was at its height. In 1871, he asserted that the use of candles on the altar, incense, and genuflections were lawful because they symbolized the real spiritual presence of Christ, which the Episcopal Church upheld along with the Orthodox and the Lutherans. To the General Convention of 1874, de Coven expressed the religious conviction that underlay, con, underlay his churchmanship. You may take away from us, if you will, every external ceremony. You may take away altars and super altars, lights and incense and vestments, and we will submit to you. But, gentlemen, to adore Christ's person in his sacrament, that is the inalienable privilege of every Christian and Catholic heart. How we do it, the way we do it, the ceremonies with which we do it, are utterly, utterly indifferent. The thing itself is what we plead for. Because of his advocacy of the ritualist cause, consents were not given to his consecration as Bishop of Wisconsin in 1874 and of Illinois in 1875. Despite calls to serve at prominent parishes in New York City, Boston, Cincinnati, and Philadelphia, he remained in his post at Racine College, where his students admired him as a model of great learning, gracious manners, personal holiness, and extraordinary compassion. He died there on March 19, 1879, and is buried on the grounds. <clears throat> so, a lot of the rituals that we many people still do um, within the Episcopal Church. Uh, James de Coven was one of those who was who fought for them to be able to stay. Um, there was a time when um, there was this idea that everything should be as bare as possible because all of these things are idolatry. So things like candles icons, which are not common in the Episcopal Church, but are allowed, um, altar hangings, even sometimes altars themselves. Uh, it's the time when there was a movement away from regular practice of the Eucharist to more morning and evening prayer um, as the standard and the, the Eucharist on occasion. Um, so the centrality of the Eucharist was preserved by this movement. Um, the use of incense, um, all kinds of things which, which are still used in the Episcopal Church, many of which are optional, but some of which are really kind of standard. I, the idea of, of candles on the altar. Almost every Episcopal Church has candles on the altar. Um, that was preserved by James de Coven and others like him. The idea that these things are not idolatrous, but are symbols of the real and living presence of Jesus Christ. Um, so that's James de Coven. Then we have Jonathan Edwards, theologian. 
uh, he, he was uh, an American revivalist preacher, philosopher, and congregationalist theologian. Um, he was born uh, on October 5th, 1703, and died on March 22nd, 1758. Um, a leading figure in, of the American Enlightenment, Edwards is widely regarded as one of America's most important and original philosophical theologians. Edwards' theological work is broad in scope, but rooted in um, pedobaptist, um, so baptism of in infants. Um, so the pedobaptist Puritan heritage, as exemplified in the Westminster and Savoy Convention, Confessions of Faith. Recent studies have emphasized how thoroughly Edwards grounded his life's work on the conceptions of beauty, harmony, and eth ethical fittingness and how central the Age of Enlightenment was to his mindset. Edwards played a critical role in shaping the first Great Awakening and oversaw um, some of the first revivals in 1733-35 to 35 at his church in Northampton, Massachusetts. His theological work gave, gave rise to a distinct school of theology known as New England Theology. Edwards delivered a sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, a classic of early American literature, during another revival in 1741, following George Whitefield's tour of the Thirteen Colonies. Edwards is well known for his many books, such as The End for Which God Created the World and The Life of David Brainerd, which inspired thousands of missionaries throughout the 19th century, and Religious Affections, which many Calvinist evangelicals still read today. Edwards died from, small, from a smallpox inoculation shortly after beginning the presidency at the College of New Jersey in Princeton. So that's Jonathan Edwards. Let us prepare for worship. Jesus said, If anyone will come to me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The Lord open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, let us adore him. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded to the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Harden not your hearts as your forebears did in the wilderness. At Meribah, and on that day at Massa, when they tempted me, they put me to the test, though they had seen my works. Forty years long I detested that generation and said, This people are wayward in their hearts, they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, let us adore him. A reading from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we engage in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel or of the glory of Christ. Who is the image of God? For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give light, the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that they may be made so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. 
We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. So for while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Here ends the reading. A couple of really important things in this. Um, one that Paul repeats several times in this small reading, which is that um, the church is about Jesus, not about the church. <laughs> so what we do is let Jesus' light shine out, not proclaim ourselves as the arbiters of truth. Um, and the church often gets this, I think, very wrong. What we are supposed to be doing is sharing Jesus, not sharing doctrine. Um, doctrine is for ourselves. So the the particular beliefs of a denomination, of a congregation, are for the congregation. The sharing of the light of Jesus, the sharing of the good news of salvation for all people, of forgiveness, of um, justice for the poor and the, the downtrodden, the outcast, that's our outward face. So all of these rules that we create, all of these um, beliefs that restrict our lives, that's fine for inside, not for imposing outside. Um, and he goes on with this part about, you know, we are afflicted but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed always carrying the death of Jesus Christ in our bodies so that his life can be shown in us. So this part is really about that placing, understanding that we are under greater restriction, greater uh, punishment, greater greater puzzlement. So the, the whole idea that we know the answers, no. Um, we are perplexed but not driven to despair. So the fact that we don't understand is part of who we are. It's not something to cause despair. We don't need to know the answers. Um, all of these things are about accepting upon ourselves the cares of the world, not putting our cares onto the world. Um, so we take this death upon ourselves so that the life of Christ can shine forth from us. And we, I think, often get that backwards. We take on the life of Jesus Christ and push the death out saying, you know, everybody else is doing it wrong. It, it's So that's what I see in this reading from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice excuse me, and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, 
your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Now, I have a prayer for um, James DeCoven. I do not have one for Jonathan Edwards. The Episcopal Church has collects for, for their commemorations and feasts. The Evangelical Lutheran Church doesn't do that. At least not that I've found. Almighty and everlasting God, who let your servant James de Coven, who led your servant James de Coven to honor your presence at the altar, and constantly to point to Christ, grant that all ministers and stewards of your mysteries may impart to your faithful people the knowledge of your presence and the truth of your grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hardwood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For, for the honor of your name. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you, and you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now our desires and petitions as may be best for us. Um, granting us in this world the knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting amen let us bless the lord thanks be to god the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all now uh, forevermore amen God bless you, and I will see you online or in person on Sunday. This has been Morning Prayer from All Saints Church, a Lutheran Episcopal community in Washington Courthouse, Ohio, um, and St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Hillsboro, Ohio, for the lesser feast of James de Coven, the commemoration of Jonathan Edwards. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>